1. Chapter 1. Move it, numbnuts, a grizzled veteran barked. The radio did nothing to mask his voice. Helmet to helmet transmission here was open channel, which meant everyone heard it. And they were set to receive, not transmit, so the recruits or new meat could just listen. Listen and obey. John Renard rolled his head forward and marched away from the shuttle bay. The cargo ship that hovered over the dusty landing site blew particles of sand across the back of his spacesuit and helmet. He could hear the grit bouncing off the reinforced skin, but couldn't feel it as it pelted him. A hover car rolled beside him stacked with black sealed body bags. A tube dropped from the cargo bay and vacuumed the dead into the recently emptied compartment. Sound didn't carry in the thin atmosphere of Mars, but John Renard watched it with ice-gray eyes that squinted against the blowing dust even as his faceplate kept the grit from reaching him. A half-dozen warriors limped toward the shuttle, trudging in the sand and stirring up more grit for the ever-present winds to catch. The protective visors were down on their faceplates. John couldn't make out their features, but the scorch marks, rips, and pressure bandages on their spacesuits told him they were fresh from battle, wounded. Welcome to hell, one of them muttered across the static-filled radio to the dozen recruits standing around John. Don't know where you're going, said the short man beside him. John didn't know his name, he didn't know any of them, just strangers crammed together in the back of a metal box and dropped to the red planet. They blew our transport to shit, the man told the veterans. Damn it. But they still shuffled to the shuttle. It was the only way off the planet and even piled on top of the dead bodies, it offered respite from the sandblast effect of the wind, no matter how brief. Renard slung his blaster across his shoulder and shuffled toward the main encampment. The wind picked up and showered their crisp new uniforms with a dusting of red sand. 2. Chapter 2 The sun is the same on Mars as it's seen from Earth. The rotation of the planet matched the home world, so the glowing orb popped up on what would be the eastern horizon back home. It glittered across mineral formations in a ridge, casting sparkles of color across the valley floor below, the light tinged with a red hue. After dawn the sun marched across the sky, oblivious to the conflict on any of the eight planets and Pluto that orbited in its system. Renard couldn't hear the crunch of his boots in the sand, but he could feel it. The ground underfoot was slippery and unsure as he crested the ridge. Even though his suit was climate-controlled and sealed, he sweated. Water dripped down his face and fell into moisture collectors that worked overtime to dehumidify the air. It collected the water vapor from his breath, the sweat, and even his urine, if he bothered to create any, and recycled it for reclamation. He thought about drinking his own piss, missed a step on his footing, and pitched across the top of the ridge. Renard rolled downhill in the light gravity, bouncing as he slid in a skittering of rocks and dirt. He skidded to a stop on his back, staring up at the red-colored sky. Behind him, squad leader Desmond Harper stopped at the top of the ridge and spread his leg in a sure-footed stance, looking like a pirate king surveying his domain. The remainder of the squad spread behind him below the ridgeline, Ten nervous men staring at the back of their leader. Was he hit? A voice called over the radio. Do we take cover? A second squawked. Desmond held up a fist to get their attention. Radio quiet, he growled in a low voice. Even he wasn't sure why they had to be quiet on the radio, but that was command decision, and he followed it like commandments from the mountaintop. Command said, and Desmond did, he liked to think. Even if he was sure the shortwave closed-loop transmission used a scrambled digital signal that couldn't be picked up by lick receivers. Except they found men without helmets. He knew that, so maybe the licks were listening. Hell knows they always seemed to be on patrol routes ready to ambush them. Desmond made a graceful leap and landed next to Renard. He bent down and pulled him up by the regulator on the back of his pack. No time to rest, the squad leader said. He shoved Renard forward to point position again and waited for him to get 20 feet into the valley before motioning the rest of the men to follow. Renard kept his eyes on a swivel, even though he had a restricted field of vision due to the helmet. This design was better than the first generation, though. 
The faceplates on Gen 1 suits had been little more portholes cut into three sides of a solid helmet, designed to stand up to the immense pressure of the atmosphere. It looked like a diving helmet from the early days of sea exploration and was practically impossible to fight well in. This iteration, the third or fourth version, looked like a fishbowl sliced in half and welded into a bubble. He still couldn't see over his shoulders without turning around his whole body. For all Renard knew, his squad was gone, and even now licks were sneaking up behind him. His fingers closed on the grip of his rifle even tighter, and he keyed the carbon dioxide filters in the suit with his chin. Paranoia was an early sign of a gas mixture problem. The radio lines were open. If the licks attacked, someone would scream or grunt or just make a sound. He would have heard it. He spied something half buried in the sand ahead and held up his fist to signal a halt as he dropped to one knee. Desmond marched up and dropped beside him. Movement, Renard nodded in the direction of what caught his attention. Desmond grunted. You have to point in a spacesuit, Meade. I can't see what you're talking about. Renard lifted one hand and pointed, keeping the other firmly on the rifle. Desmond followed the direction and stood up. He marched to a Marine in a spacesuit, laying under the start of a sand dune. The face was withered and mummified, staring through a broken faceplate, the blaster burned mouth open in a permanent scream. He won't hurt you. Desmond bent down to record his identifier tags and signal for a retrieval. They told us the licks hide under the sand. Renard moved up next to him. Desmond finished keying the request and clicked send on the communicator. Forget what they teach you down there, Meade. Forget it real quick, you read me. Out here I am the law. You do what I say, and you might live another day or two. Yes, sir. Now move out. Renard snapped off a salute and trudged ahead of the squad, topping another rise as they left the valley. He lost his footing on the loose sand again, but this time landed on his bottom and slid down the hill. God damn it, Desmond called over the radio. Get Grazer up here to point before this new meat gets us all killed. Desmond topped the hill and leaped down to land beside Renard again, as graceful as a ballerina in the low-gravity environment. What the hell's the matter with you? You trying to tell every goddamn lick our location? Grazer hustled over the hill. His grungy spacesuit sported a few blaster burns, but he looked like every other long-timer in the squad. Renard couldn't tell them apart yet, except for the names painted in block letters on the sleeves of the suits. Point, sir. I want a ten-meter point, you read me. If any of those scaly bastards are in two clicks, I want to know it. Aye, aye, sir. Grazer marched to point, separating himself thirty feet from the group. The rest of the squad shoved past Renard and ignored him except for the last man. The name on his sleeve read Weber, and he held out a hand as he stopped next to the new recruit. You okay? I can't get to my feet, Renard struggled in the sand. One-third gravity, Weber lifted him up. The simulations never get you ready. Weber keyed a readout, and the reflective protection in his faceplate faded out so Renard could see his face. He was handsome, gentle-looking with piercing blue eyes more choir boy than killer. I was top of the class, Renard started. Doesn't do you much good out here, huh? Take small steps. Renard nodded and tested his footing. Keep your visor reflected. Blocks the sun. You think it won't hurt you because we're farther away, but Mars don't got an atmosphere like we do back home. Let's too much gamma through. Thanks. I will. One of his squad mates scurried back to Weber. The name on his sleeve was scratched out and a hastily drawn replacement was scrawled above it. Bellhop. His faceplate dims to reveal a young black face, high cheekbone etched like they were drawn from granite. He smiled at Weber and it went on for days. Anything. They cleaned him out, Bellhop answered. Weber put his hand on Renard's shoulder and started moving them forward after the rest of the group. You find a body, you take his ammo, his power clip and air canister. You don't know when you're gonna run out and need more. You got it. Got it. We better catch up. 
Licks catch us out here alone, and they'll take our gear. 3. Chapter 3. They rendezvoused with the rest of the company later that afternoon, just before dusk. There were 15 squads comprised of 12 men each, but the small contingent seemed insignificant against the expansive horizon of the Martian desert. The squads worked with vibrating shovels to scoop foxholes into the sand. They were building a circle, roughly a hundred yards in radius, with another foxhole in the center. They worked in silence except for grunts and breathing. The open radio line meant every sound and sigh was transmitted to every other marine in the company, but the alternative was a chaos of confusion if they tried to click through different channels. Here it comes, one of the suits pointed. He had the name Burley stamped on his sleeve and stood next to the commander of the company, Cree. All of the marines stopped as a tiny hover jet scooted over the horizon and zeroed in on their position. It passed over and dropped three supply canisters that plopped into the sand, sending up small geysers that added to the windblown grid. Retrieve those, Cree commanded, but... Burley was already motioning three men out of the group to get the supplies. Cree watched the hover jet race away from their position. An RPG zoomed out of the hills after it, hit a wing, and lit up the sky with a brilliant fireball. Did you get a read on that? Cree turned to Burley. Fifteen clicks, sir. They're coming tonight, Cree cursed. If they know we're here. They know. The commander turned back to his foxhole. Get those men to double-time it. And get me a line to HQ. On the edge of the perimeter, Weber directed Renard and Bellhop in widening the hole they were digging. All three worked in unison. Weber drew a number in the sand and pointed at it with the tip of his shovel. Bellhop clicked the communication channel over to the new frequency and tapped Renard on the arm to do the same. Renard keyed the radio in his headset, a little worried about being cut off from the rest of the group, but he wanted to fit in with the men who had shown him the first kindness he'd seen on the harsh planet. The first kindness he'd known since training really. Music filtered through his headset, along with chatter from other men in the squad, as they dug the next hole over. Glad they got it after it dropped our rations, said Bellhop in a deep voice that belied his youthful face. Wouldn't be the first time we've gone without. They finished the hole with rough dimensions. Six feet deep like a grave, thought Renard. Ten feet wide, ten feet across. They dropped down into the hole and began to line the walls with a plastic alloy to seal it from the Martian soil. I've never seen one made before, he huffed into the radio. That little hole is going to be your slice of heaven tonight, Bellhop said. You can take that can off and breath fresh air. I wouldn't call it fresh, Weber interjected. I know what you grunts smell like. Six weeks since I had a shower. And I ain't the worst. Don't you believe him. It's been eight weeks. The two men laughed with each other, the kind of laugh that comes from an easy sense of familiarity. You boys having fun? They stopped laughing as Commander Cree's voice cut across the music on the frequency in their headset. The three men glanced up, started to snap to attention. At ease, Cree said. Desmond and Burley stepped up next to him. I want the men in tight and sleeping in ten minutes. Set up advanced sentries one click beyond our perimeter. If we get visitors tonight, I want to know before they drop in on top of me. Yes, sir, Weber snapped off a salute. Cree popped one back on the reflective visor of his faceplate and moved to the next hole. Squad Commanders in Tow 4. Chapter 4 On the edge of the perimeter, a man in a spacesuit dug a long, narrow depression deep enough to fit a body and little else. The name gear was etched on the side of his suit, and he moved the vibrating shovel with practiced ease. He finished carving out a low spot in the sand and lay down in it, facing out toward the desert. He pulled his blaster close and watched the empty landscape in front of him. Behind him, Weber and Bellhop dropped into the recently completed foxhole. Renard prepared to jump when his comlink squawked. Renard. Sir, he keyed the link. Take a position one click out from gear. And don't fall asleep. 
Renard looked down at Weber. He shrugged and gave him a glove thumbs up. What the hell are you waiting on? Desmond barked across the radio. Weber keyed a control panel set in the side of the plastic sheeting on the walls. The top of the foxhole shimmered in a pale covering of energy that obscured everything inside of it, like looking through opaque glass. It's covered with a layer of dust before Renard can even turn around. He trudged toward Gear's position, gave a small wave as he passed. You keep your fucking eyes open, new meat, the man said over the open line. Don't get me killed. Renard marched past the perimeter set by Gear and stopped roughly one click out. He was two from the foxhole that served as the command center and saw other lone bodies scattered along a far space line with him. When the sun drifted below the ridge on the horizon, shadows danced across the valley, bathing it in dusky twilight. Renard knelt and scraped a hole with his shovel, then lay down with his rifle to watch the darkness grow complete. Stars winked to life bathing the desert with a soft white glow. There was no atmosphere to filter out the weak ones, no pollution to hide their brilliance. It was like laying under the glare of a full moon it was so bright, but the otherworldly whiteness made everything stark and pale. Renard wondered how long First Watch lasted and who would come to relieve him. Less than a day on planet, and he was stuck on guard duty on the perimeter of a primitive camp in hostile territory. He didn't know much about the licks. Nine feet tall, most of them, if the holographs had been correct. They came from Planet Nine, or the dark planet that scientists discovered orbiting beyond Pluto once it was relegated out of planethood. That was how the world learned about the Space Defense Corp and the imminent threat of alien invasion. He had been a kid then, when a shuttle crashed into Central Park and told the whole world about a universe beyond their tiny cities and towns. It was the end of war on the planet and the beginning of a global effort to save the Earth. That didn't make much difference to Renard. War on Mars was like war planet side. The poor were drafted or conscripted. The rich stayed in the safety of their homes and worked on building protective barriers around the cities. Defense contractors got rich while providing substandard weapons, shelter and food for the poor idiots who were blasted to the red planet to fight for a way of life they never enjoyed. Renard did think it was funny how the government took over SpaceX and Boeing under a wartime eminent domain clause and then rewarded the owners and shareholders with contracts worth trillions of dollars. Fat lot of good it did him now as he stared down at the $1 MRE pouch in his hand. He couldn't create a vacuum seal in his post and couldn't move the food from his hand to his helmet in the Mars atmosphere. All that money to all those companies, all the brains behind the fight to hold off the invasion and keep it off planet, and none of them could help him eat his first night in. He studied the desert in front of him, memorizing the contours of the rocks, the shapes the sand made. He really tried to keep his eyes roving, just like he'd been taught, but the darkness and the numbing pain in his stomach kept him preoccupied. He thought about home and his first day. He thought about how many ridges they'd covered to reach this position. He thought about meditating, a tool they taught in training to keep his mind focused and relaxed. He practiced breathing in and out, in and out, until his eyes slipped closed in his propped-up helmet. He couldn't move his legs. The blowing wind had created a sand drift across his body, hiding all but his helmet and upper body under a makeshift dune that grew on top of him. Renard watched the landscape. He knew he drifted off because the shadows were different. He just couldn't place what woke him. His eyes tracked the rocks, the horizon as he searched. Ten yards ahead of him, a shadow blocked out the starlight. It moved toward him in slow measured steps, a giant humanoid shape in a spacesuit and helmet shaped like a huge snout. Renard looked at the comm link embedded in his helmet. Would they hear him if he called out a warning? Should he chance it? The figure shifted closer one slow step at a time. A second coalesced out of the darkness, and then a third and fourth, all moving in on his position. He wanted to move his blaster, to squeeze off a shot before they got him. Maybe it would warn the others. Maybe he could take one with him before they cracked open his visor and killed him. The first one was almost on him, and then it was stepping past him. The giant almost crushed his leg. 
he could feel the weight of it on the sand as it came down next to him. The second lick stopped in front of him, its eyes glued to the back of the leader. A red light on its helmet blinked on and off, bouncing a reflection off of Renard's visor. The lick swung its blaster down and skipped back. Renard aimed and fired. His laser slammed into the lick with a puff of smoke, and it careened into the third. The leader swung around and fired at the depression. Renard rolled out of the way, screaming into the headset as he shot back. The blast caught the lick in the shoulder, spun it around. Here drilled a blast through its chest plate. A blaster bolt slammed into the back of Renard and ripped open his air tank. An explosive mix of air erupted into the atmosphere and hurled him back toward gear and the camp, the propulsion carrying him inside the perimeter. He gasped for air as bodies boiled out of the foxholes, the shimmering force fields collapsing in a shower of dust. The Marines fired into the darkness around the perimeter, creating a web of laser blasts that were answered from the shadows beyond. Renard watched the blue stars popping in front of his eyes as he struggled for air. The pressure in his head mounted, his eyes bugging out, blood vessels popping in his nose sprayed the inside of his visor with red mist. Weber grabbed him and rolled him over. He slapped a patch onto his back and worked with a laser knife to slice the damaged tube and bypass the damaged regulator to a second air tank. Renard sucked in a lungful of air as the tank filled his suit and the patch held. Weber held up a thumb, and Renard answered, albeit not as fast as the second in command. Weber slapped him on the back and jumped up with his rifle. He ran toward the perimeter with his blaster blazing. Renard watched him go. After a moment, when he felt like he could breath, he rolled over to his knees and shoved himself up on shaky legs. By then it was too late. The licks lost the element of surprise and disappeared back into the Stygian darkness of the Martian desert. Renard watched the aftermath. Desmond held a blaster askew on his hip as he marched among the dead. There were no wounded Marines. He reached gear and rolled him over. Strip his supplies, his tired voice echoed over the radio comlink. He glanced around as the Marines retreated for the safety of their foxholes. He spied Burley who held up a finger and made another hand signal that drew his attention to Weber and Bellhop. Commander Cree slipped up beside Desmond. How bad? Two down. One wounded. Call for medvac. Let's go see what they have. Cree and Desmond moved over to the foxhole as Weber and Bellhop reached it. They dropped a long lean lick body down in the hole and hopped in beside it. Renard didn't know what to do, and no one gave him any orders, so he slid over the edge of the foxhole and settled in a corner. The lick was just over nine feet tall in a form-fitting spacesuit with no discernible air pack. They couldn't make out its features behind the snout-shaped visor. Alive, Desmond asked. Don't know how long, said Weber and lifted one of its arms. A nasty-looking blaster wound cracked open and spilled blood and ichor onto the plastic-covered floor. Blood and burn kept the atmosphere out. Till you moved it, said Desmond. He bent to examine the prisoner. Do you want to interrogate it, sir? He asked Cree. Couldn't we just kill it? It might have information. Do you want the honor? Desmond smiled. Bellhop moved to the wall and squatted down next to Renard. You alive. Renard struggled to sit up. Bellhop reached over and lifted him off the wall to a more comfortable position. Shit, you barely made it. How much you got left? Renard dragged the second pack by the tube and studied the readout. A minute. Bellhop shook his head and laughed. You either crazy or brave to cut it that close. He unclipped an air canister off his pack and passed it over. I owe you, said Renard. You damn right, you old man. Just remember. I know where you sleep. Desmond finished interrogating the prisoner. Take him to command, he ordered. Two of the Marines, Tay and Stoker, jumped to comply. They each hooked an arm under the lick and dragged him out of the hole. Desmond glared at Renard and Bellhop. If you ladies are through trading recipes, get some rest. 
He hopped out of the hole, followed by Cree. 5. Chapter 5 Weber waited for the two other Marines to jump back down after they dropped the lick at the perimeter. He engaged the force field and made a circling motion with his hand. The quick hiss release of helmets filled the tiny bubble. Bellhop leaned over and rapped on Renard's faceplate. Take it off, baby, take it all off. Renard popped his top and set it down. Weber crawled over and plopped it back into his lap. Keep it close, he advised. If we lose integrity, you have about five seconds to lock it. Right. The mood in the foxhole was jovial, as the survivors of the attack relaxed a level, just happy to be alive. Renard glanced around the names on the sleeves and tried to match them with faces so he could remember. Weber and Bellhop leaned against the wall on one side of him. Tay, a buck-toothed redneck from the wilds of the south sat across from him with an absent-minded grin. Leroy sat on the left of him, Stoker on the right, both with coal-black skin that stood out in stark contrast to the red dirt under the plastic wall. Wong sat by himself in a corner, huddled and hunched over. What were you doing out there? Wong called to Renard after a moment. I'd be sleeping, Tay piped up. You was sleeping the last time we got attacked, Stoker jostled him with his elbow. What can I say? His freckles bounced around as he talked past his impossibly large white teeth. I need my beauty rest. Sleep longer, Wong called out. Where are you from, New Meat? Bellhop asked. Arkansas. What the hell is Arkansas? Weber said. It's in the middle. Only two things come from Arkansas, Tay chortled. And you ain't got no horns. Dumbass, that's Texas. Same thing, said Stoker. It's a whole other state. Where are you from? Renard asked Leroy. Detroit. Detroit ain't a state, said Bellhop. It's a state of mind, Leroy said in a smooth voice. Keep it down, Weber warned. We don't want to bring the man in on us. Renard opened up an MRE and set it on his leg. His first pouch was probably still out there drifting in the wind. He would have to grab some more to resupply. He picked at the hardtack like bread as he worked to repair the regulator on his pack. You need any help? Weber asked. I did okay. He stopped. The schematic on the inside flap of his suit didn't match the reality of the regulator he was working with. The contractors who supplied them had mixed up the orders, matching the wrong suits with a different, less expensive and less reliable regulator. At training, Weber said with a tiny laugh. Here, let me. He dragged the regulator off his lap and began working on it in quick, precise movements that were way too practiced. Why are you helping me so much? Renard asked. Where he was from, no one helped much, at least not without a price attached. And he didn't have anything to trade up here, so he was afraid of what the older man might ask of him. He don't want you dead, said Bellhop. What are you? Nineteen. Yeah, Renard said in a sullen voice. They ship you kids up here, and you don't know shit. I want you to live two weeks, so you can start learning something. Like what we're fighting for. You figure that out, and they'll make you a general. Then we can all go home. Tops on, said Weber. He passed the repaired regulator back to Renard, who donned his air pack and locked his helmet back on. He barely got it sealed when the force field collapsed and showered them with red dust. Desmond dropped into the hole. Renard, you let the lick get in the perimeter, you babysit him. Is that such a good idea, said Weber. You got rank on me, Sergeant. No, sir. Well, when you do, you can second-guess my orders. Until then, you keep your fucking mouth shut. Weber saluted as his faceplate shifted to reflector mode. One by one, the men in the hole did the same, the jovial mood eclipsed by something else. Renard watched them for a moment, then scrambled out of the hole. 6. Chapter 6 Renard listened to the sound of his own breath as it reverberated inside his helmet. The harsh sand-covered landscape was still bathed in the soft glowing shadows, but instead of being peaceful, it was scary. 
spooky, like a ghost world where each dark spot was a potential enemy. He ran for the command hub in the hole in the center of their circle and couldn't help but think about the westerns he watched when he was a small child. He couldn't remember much about them, images really, and the whooping of the Indians as they surrounded a circled wagon train. Bad guys wore black, the good guys had white hats. That was before. In the after, there was no television, and bad guys wore everything. After, it seemed like there were no white hats left in the world. He reached the open command hole, and slipped over the edge in a scree of dirt and sand. Burley and Cree stood over a holographic map, on the far side of the small enclosure with four other captains. Burley turned at his entrance, and pointed to a figure bundled in a shadowed corner. Renard tossed off a quick salute, as the force field powered up to create a small dome over the hole. He felt the air fill the room, but didn't hear it. It was a change in pressure against the outside of his suit. Kree slid his helmet off with a sigh of relief, and the others followed his lead. Five years ago, the Lick showed up on Mars and built an fob to launch an attack against the Earth. His gnarled hands moved across the holographic landscape. We call it Beachhead. Right here. Our first airborne forays were shot down by their weapon emplacements here and here. Our attempts to reach the colony have been met with extreme resistance. Our mission is to eliminate their defensive capabilities so we can send in bombers. Burley leaned over and keyed the holograph. The map shifted to show a different view, a topographical map of the terrain between their location and beachhead. We think two squads working in tandem can reach the colony without detection and open a hole in their defense grid. Renard watched the briefing and ignored the lick. He wondered why they were spelling out the plan in front of the enemy. What if he was transmitting? Surely they searched him for a radio before dropping him in the command tent. Or what if it was telepathic? He didn't know anything about licks, at least beyond how to kill them, which was the sum of what was taught in training. Maybe they knew more than he did. What is it, Marine? Cree barked. You can't concentrate on your prisoner? Renard jumped. Yes, sir. Burley leaned up and whispered in Cree's ear. You think that licks a security risk? Sir. My second here says your poker face ain't working, son. You think we're giving the enemy our mission details? Renard gulped. Maybe the lick wasn't telepathic. Maybe Burley was. He glanced over the commander's shoulder, and the second grinned at him. You've been down here how long? First day, sir. New meat. You think you know more about how to run this show than me? No, sir. You think I haven't considered all of the options? Sir, Renard stuttered. The look in Cree's eyes made it hard for him to meet them. It was more than fire. A maniacal glee that turned his pupils into giant black holes that filled the whole iris. There were galaxies in those eyes, and more. Madness, maybe. Renard could see the reflection of the glow lamps in them, like twin beacons bearing down on him. And then he was. Cree marched across the floor and pulled a small thin cylinder from his belt. He held it inches from the neck of the prisoner and clicked a button. A laser blade burned like a miniature torch and sliced through the lick's neck. It twitched twice as it died. This belonged to him. Cree shut it off and held the hilt to Renard. Keep it. That's how we handle security risks around here. Renard fumbled the grip and attached it to his belt. Cree went back to the map, and with no prisoner to watch, Renard drifted after him. He cast a glance over his shoulder at the still body on the sand floor, smoke curling up from a hole in its neck. On my mark, we'll move our teams out and split up. Each of you has been given target coordinates. You will reach your target and destroy it. You will succeed where others have failed. You will help me end this war so I can go home to my wife and son. You will save the earth. Am I understood? Yes, sir, the captains barked back. Burley, Cree said as he grabbed his helmet and settled it on his head. Escort that Marine back to Desmond's squad. I want them first out. Aye, aye, said the second. 
He motioned Renard to don his helmet, as the other captains did too. Renard heard it. The hiss of a vacuum, as a small compressor in the corner sucked the oxygen in the enclosure down into a tank, before the second keyed the command to disengage the force field. Burley jabbed his elbow toward the edge of the pit and leapt up with grace and ease. Renard tried to emulate. He made it high enough, but stumbled on the landing and fought for balance. The second grabbed his arm at the last second before he tipped, helped him upright, and marched with him back to his squad's foxhole. 7. Chapter 7 The sunrise on Mars happened abruptly. The sun rolled up over the horizon, spreading a bright band of light that marched like a line across the sand. Renard saw the glow pass over his feet and keep moving away from him, then stopped to turn and stare. The burning orb reflected on the golden-tinted visor in his helmet. He turned back to point and kept moving through the sand, his footsteps a little more sure with experience, but still uncertain as he learned to move the weighted footplates in lighter gravity. The radio in his helmet sputtered. Hold up, Desmond instructed them. Renard stopped and lifted his blaster to the ready. Nothing moved in front of him. Just dunes a hill, depressions in the rock full of dust and sand. Somewhere past the nothing was the lion's den. Beachhead. Weber. Stoker. Move up. Triangulate point. Weber and Stoker moved with graceful ease up to Renard and shifted ten paces to either side of him. Weber cleared his faceplate and shared a wink with Renard before going reflective again. I didn't see anything. That's just what they want you to see, said Stoker. Radio quiet, Desmond instructed. Let's go. The trio marched forward, slower this time, as they searched the ground ahead of him. Pissed, Weber hissed over the radio and they froze. He slid across the sand to ease up next to Renard, his blaster trained on a shadow under an overhanging rock. Renard spied the bunker dug into the ground and camouflaged with a hill of sand. Weber scouted the terrain, signaled Desmond. Their leader edged up to the overhang, helmet on a swivel as he tried to keep eyes everywhere. The bunker could be a feint with licks hiding under the sand, ready to pop up and ambush them. Or they could be waiting in the darkness, ready to boil out like ants as soon as some silent trigger was released. Desmond motioned Renard to follow him in. They moved to the edge of the of the overhang and peered under. It's a long, shallow trench that runs along the length of the rock, carved out of the sand and extending in the darkness further than they can see. The rest of the squad pulls tighter to form a half circle around the trench. Half faced in, rifles held ready and the other half turned out, watching and waiting. Desmond clicked his radio. Weber silently slipped over the side of the hill and down into the trench. Another click sent Leroy and Wong to stand sentry on each edge of the trench, their faces hidden by visors. Wong fidgeted with his gear as he stood, checking his power clip, his air canister as his eyes roamed the darkness in the ground and the sun-drenched landscape around them. Weber dropped to his stomach and flashed a maglight off the end of his rifle barrel. The LED beam lit up the interior of the rock like a miniature sun. The light revealed more carved rock and a tunnel that extended even further. Weber crawled down the tunnel, his knees and elbows scratching a zigzag pattern in the dust. Desmond lowered his rifle and pulled a tablet out of a suit pocket. He keyed it and followed a glowing dot that represented Weber as he disappeared into the tunnel. Wong looked over at Leroy, standing as still as a statue. Desmond keyed a button, and a grainy video image from Weber's helmet transmitted back to him. The image washed over a figure leaning against the tunnel wall. The tip of his rifle moved toward it, carrying the light further in to show it was a lick. Dead and mummified. A blast hole in the suit it wore. Weber crawled toward it, dragged the rifle off the body, and kept advancing. Leroy glanced toward the other squad members as they watched the landscape. He turned back toward the trench. A lick popped out of a sand-covered tunnel in front of him. It blasted him backwards. The other Marines in the squad hit the ground and returned fire. Desmond screamed for calm as the men blasted the ground around the lick, 
the rock overhang. The lick slid back into the tunnel and began to run into the darkness. A blast sent it out of the hole into the open, a smoking crater in its chest. Weber crawled out covered in sand and grime. Hold your fire, he keyed over the radio. Hold your fire. He climbed out of the second bunker entrance and knelt to check on Leroy. The lick hit him in the chest, almost the same spot where it took a round. He started stripping the supplies off the body. That tunnel branches off five times just in the leg I was in. If each of those five branches off again. His squad mates turn around to examine the land they just traversed. They could be surrounded by licks, hiding in the sand, ready to pop out or drag them down. They had no way of knowing, but it felt like they were in it pretty deep. Did you see a communications array? Desmond asked. Just because I didn't see it, doesn't mean it isn't there. They could know we're coming. Or they might not communicate the way we do. This could be an independent unit, like us, working on its own for the same goal. Stopping us. Yes, sir. Desmond turned to Renard and Tay. Sweep the perimeter. Everyone meet on my mark. Bring Leroy over here. Bellhop and Wong lifted Leroy's blasted body up by the arms and dragged him through the sand. They laid him down without ceremony in the trench by Desmond and turned back to watch with the others. Nothing stirred behind them except for the dust, the wind. Renard thought it was one of the weirdest things about being on Mars. The lack of sound. Sure, it was easy to hear the breathing of his squad mates over the open communicator lines, but the wind on Earth would whistle, howl, or just rattle as it shifted over and around things. Up here it all happened outside of his suit, a self-contained little world that left him feeling disconnected from the environment. Not that there was much connection back in the atmosphere, but at least he could hear. It was one of the first lines of defense growing up on the streets. One developed a keen ear for danger approaching. Footsteps in the dark. The roar of a hoverjet engine as the homeless were hunted for conscription into the marines. Here there be dragons and silence. They couldn't hear them roar. Our mission may have been compromised, Desmond announced, his voice tight. They might be watching us now. We don't know. I need all eyes open. I need all periscopes up. We move in radio silence and fast. Our goal is that damn gun emplacement. If you are the last goddamn man standing, then you move for that gun and gut it. Got it. Yes, sir. The radio squawked softly. Bellhop. Wong. Pull point. The two Marines checked the power packs on their rifles and began the slow jog across the sand, feet touching off little dust storms the wind picked up to carry across the valley floor. The rest of the men fell in with them. Run quiet. Run fast. Stay alert. Weber jogged next to Renard and clapped him on the shoulder. Then he was gone, moving ahead so that Renard could only see the sand-colored suit as they spread out. 8. Chapter 8. Renard sucked wind. He tried to fight it, hoped to fend off a cramp before it came in, but the stitch in his side grabbed him like a vice and he slowed. His shuffling footsteps kept him going, almost looking like a run, if a turtle were making the fast pace across the sand. He could hear his breath wheezing in and out, and wondered what the others thought of the noise. The sun blazed down, the internal compensators working overtime against the heat he was building up inside the suit. He felt like he was sloshing. Better hot than cold, he thought, and remembered the global. Packed in tight with hundreds of other recruits, shoulder to shoulder sleeping on flat mat racks in the vast hole next to the shuttle bay. He could feel when the ship settled into orbit because the hum of the ion engines behind their sleeping quarters stopped. The ship creaked as retro rockets fired sporadically to maintain position. A red light above the airlock door began whirring as a siren blared throughout the ships. Red alert, a corporeal screamed. The men scrambled to lock down their helmets, grab their rifles, and hustle for the shuttles. Their bodies piled up at the bottleneck of the airlock. The simple doorway designed to allow one man through at a time was better at compartmentalizing sections in case of breach. Renard was lucky. 
He made it through in the first wave, a purple-faced sergeant screaming at him as he ran. Everybody in the cans. In the cans now. We're dropping. Renard hit the ramp into the shuttle. One of his fellow recruits snapped him around with a hand on the elbow. We're still two hours out, he shouted. Something bad is happening. Outstanding grasp of the obvious, Renard slid into the jumpsuit and clamped down the straps. He double-checked the seals on his helmet as the shuttle engine roared and lifted off the decking. Green. Green, the sergeant leapt out of the ramp as it closed with a hiss. Renard felt the shuttle turn around, and the acceleration thrust him back into his seat as it raced for the exit. An enemy rocket slammed into the ship doors as they went through. The concussion bounced the shuttle into the side of the ship and sent it on a spin through space. The recruits inside screamed, the sound locked behind their sealed helmets. Renard squeezed his eyes closed and didn't see the lifeless body of the sergeant caught in the vacuum bounce off the hull of the shuttle. The pilot pulled it out of the spin and leveled off as it skipped on the edge of atmosphere. A second shuttle spiraled past them in an uncontrolled descent. The inside of Renard's shuttle rocked like a wild thing. He was slammed against the straps, the hard wall of the hull, the ridges of the jump seat cutting into his legs. The pilot's voice came over their headsets. Everyone, hang on. We're going in tight. He could feel the rockets buck against the atmosphere as the pilot fought for control. 9. Chapter 9 Captain Mike Dawson stared at the curvature of the Red Planet as they settled into orbit. His young face was lined with concern as he watched rockets arc out of the atmosphere and zero in on his ship. All hands red alert, his second called out. Prepare stations, Dawes called out. A red light began strobing on the bridge, the emergency signal blaring throughout the ship. Return fire, Dawes commanded. Explosions rocked the ship as enemy rockets slammed into the hull plating. Fire at will, Dawes said. Rockets arced up off batteries on the ship and raced toward the Martian atmosphere. Two shuttles out, the second yelled. We've lost hull integrity. They hit the shuttle bay. Control? No helm. The wide-eyed ensign stared up at him. Full batteries, Dawes told the second. Feed them hell. The second turned to comply as a rocket slammed into the bridge. Shrapnel sprayed from the control panels and pierced him against the far wall. Dawes climbed up and surveyed the sparking carnage through acrid smoke. All hands abandoned ship. Anne, his communications officer, pulled herself back to station and keyed the radio for the automated announcement. All hands to designated life pods. All hands to designated life pods. It repeated on a loop. Transfer controls to my station, Dawes said to the injured ensign. Bridge crew to the escape pods. His first mate Columbus didn't move from his station. Captain. I'm not dumb enough to go down with the ship. I'm not so sure, sir. Just buying you some time. Go get our fallback command ship ready, Dawes gave him a quick grin. Columbus grabbed Anne and the ensign and hustled them out into the corridor toward the life pod. Dawson keyed the coordinates for the Lick Beachhead into the landing solution. He locked the computer and set an ion engine burn to fire, after 90 seconds turning the giant global into one hell of a bunker buster. He eyed the bridge of what had been his first, and was mostly likely his last command, then ran out of the bridge to join the others. Dawson sprinted down the smoke-filled corridor, sparks leaping from the walls, falling from the ceiling in sheets and firefalls. He ran past two dead crewmen, bodies crispy from an explosion and swore. The airlocks designed to automatically close between sections were finally beginning to whisper shut as the fried computer systems rerouted and rebooted. He raced through one airlock, barely made another, and missed the one to his life pod, almost sacrificing a hand to it. Damn it. There's room in here, Captain. Columbus stood at a manual hatch at an older multi-person lifeboat instead of the autonomous life pods. Dawson raced through the doorway and his first mate swung the hatch closed behind them, spun it locked. Seven shuttles and the life pods shot away from the global 
as explosions from the Lick rockets slammed into the hull again and again. The giant transport-turned-missile veered off course and began to disintegrate in flames and fireballs. Life pods blasted away from the Hulk even as it drilled straight down into the Red Planet. 10. Chapter 10 Renard topped a rise and stopped to stand with the others. They stared at the burned, crumpled remains of the global, spread out across the desert for thousands of yards. That your ship, Renard? Bellhop asked. It brought me here. How the hell are we supposed to get home? Weber sighed. That's what the body bags are for, said Bellhop. Who picks those up? Renard said. We got a whole corp to do that, and if you don't come the chatter, you'll all pull duty in it. They don't get to shoot back at the licks. A lick popped up out of the sand and blasted Stoker. Ambush, their voices shouted across the open calm. Weber dropped and spun, firing blasts at the lick as it slid back into the tunnel under the sand. The rest of the squad fell to the ground as they searched the perimeter. It was quiet, except for breathing in their helmets. Renard heard a click on the line. Someone. Please, Stoker whimpered. God help me. Someone. Renard crawled across the sand towards his smoking body. He could see swirls of sand twirling up off the body as air vented into the atmosphere. He reached the man, but couldn't see his face through the reflective visor, just the burnt hole in his suit that went all the way through. Suit was fused to flesh, flash sealed for the most part except for tiny leaks. It was impossible for him to be alive, but he was. He's still alive, Renard hissed. He hovered over the body. They didn't cover medical care in training. The expectation was when you were hit on Mars, you either died or lived. If you lived, they could ship you back on a shuttle. But most died. We got that, Renard. Now shut the fuck up. Help me, Renard, Stoker gasped. Please. I don't want to die up here. You're going to be all right, Stoker. Shut up. The men searched for more licks, waited. Weber shimmied across the sand toward the tunnel hole. Bellhop slid up next to Renard and pushed him aside so he could tend to Stoker. Weber reached the edge of the hole, shoved his gun through the sand and squeezed off a few blasts. Desmond jumped up and ran over to help him. He slammed down into the ground next to him, offered cover. Weber slid over the side of the hole and landed with a plop at the bottom. He stared into the black expanse of a hole, rolled right. Blaster bolts seared through the darkness and turned the sand next to him into glass. Desmond returned fire as Weber rolled upright and shot back. Their blasts filled the darkness with strobes of brilliant energy. Stoker gripped Renard's arm, dragged him closer. Don't leave me out here. How the hell is he still breathing? Bellhop whispered. Quiet man, Renard patted Stoker's arm. Holy shit. I can't feel my legs, Stoker croaked. Could you make sure my legs are straight? Desmond crunched across the sand and knelt next to him. They're straight, son. He put a strong hand on Stoker's shoulder and pressed down, reassuring him that they were close. Weber moved next to Renard and tapped Stoker's visor. The reflective material retracted. Weber gave him a wink and a grin. I got that scaly son of a bitch for you, Stoker. I'm dying, Stoker told him. Why don't you go on and do it then? Bellhop sniffed. They all watched the horizon, the perimeter, eyes roving from the land to the dying man and back up again. You got your med kit? Desmond asked. I used all mine, Bellhop answered. Renard. Renard patted his leg and arm pockets, but all he has is the laser knife hilt. I don't know. Goddamn designers, Desmond growled. Fucking med kits always fall out. He grabbed the hilt out of Renard's hand and pressed it into Stoker's neck. What are you doing? Renard lunged, but Weber grabbed his arm and dragged him back. Sleep tight, son, Desmond said. It hurts. Desmond cut him off with the blade. It slid through his neck and erupted out of the top of his helmet. Renard gagged in his helmet. Weber lifted him up and passed him over to Bellhop. Don't do it, man. 
Bellhop walked him a few paces away and made him kneel in the sand. You throw up in your can, and you can't get out of it. We could have saved him, Renard gurgled. With what? Bellhop asked. The med kits have morphine, could have eased his last few minutes maybe. This stopped it. What the hell are we doing? Renard shouted. We're blowing up a gun emplacement. Desmond stood next to him and passed the laser knife back to Renard. I mean on this fucking planet. Why are we out here? What do we care if a bunch of aliens want to make a home out of this damn place? We don't belong here. Bellhop moved back to Stoker and helped Weber strip the body of supplies they divvied up. You're damn right. Bellhop grabbed Renard by the arm and lifted him up. So let's go blow the hell out of that goddamn laser bank and get the hell up out of here. Desmond led them back toward the hole with the tunnel. They're tracking us. Weber stared into the darkness under the red sand. They'll pick us off one at a time. Where do those tunnels go? We could find out. Desmond nodded. Check the global first, he turned toward the ship. See if there are survivors or supplies. You get everything? He's clean, Bellhop answered. Let's move out. Eyes open. We still don't see them. That's going to have to change or we're dead men. Weber led them toward the global. 11. Chapter 11. They made the shadows of the global as the sun settled lower in the Martian sky. This close, the damage was extensive, the outline of the ship a massive structure of twisted metal and scorched plating, more an outline of an interplanetary cruiser than actual vessel. The ground around it rippled in dunes and ridges created by the impact crater. The ship hit the ground nose first, and even as it crumpled the decking, shifted over to fall on one side, breaking in half. The marines could see into some of the rooms and cargo bays cracked open to atmosphere, and the debris field, which spread along the crust of the crater, making it difficult to traverse in a straight line. Three shadow-drenched forms detached from the underbelly of one of the metal plates and fought up the side of the crater toward the patrol. Desmond called a halt with an upheld fist. Damn glad to see you, Davis huffed. He wore a mismatched spacesuit, sealed against the atmosphere, as if hastily donned during a rapid escape. His other two companions were similarly clad. Their names were painted on their sleeves, veterans of the Mars campaign. You boys are a long way from home, Desmond cracked a smile. He couldn't see their faces through the reflective visors, but retracted his. Damn automated pilots in the life pods brought us to the global, Davis huffed as he pulled up in front of Desmond and cleared his visor. His face was covered in streaks of soot and smoke, but he answered the Marine with a grin of his own. Didn't matter where it was. Wouldn't take off with us in it. He looked up at a blinking light in the sky on the edge of the atmosphere and raised his pistol to send a blast toward it. We've tried to recall it, said Davis. But where are we gonna go? Weber, Bellhop, Renard and Tay moved up to the edge of the crater. How many? Weber asked. Three more forms moved out of the shadows and scrambled to join the men on the ridge. Just six, answered Davis. We were scheduled to go landside, sir. Terra firma, the man next to him muttered. Your orders have changed, said Desmond. Ain't nobody coming for you, so you're in the shit with us now. We've done our tour, Jones argued. Then you can wait here. Licks have been trailing us all the way so it's just a matter of time before they show up. Or you can re-up with us. You read. Crystal, sir. Have you set camp? Established a perimeter? We were just under the global, said Davis. God damn it, man. I thought you had been in the shit. Weber, drill a hole. Desmond waved him down into the crater. Sir, Weber slid down the sand like he was surfing and moved to the shadows under the global. It would be a good place to build a camp for the night. The firm metal of the ship fused to the sand, making a solid wall they could set their backs against without fear of the enemy digging through and breaching their fortifications. Bellhop. Tay. Establish a line, Desmond continued. Bellhop and Tay hopped away from the global to set up sentry duty. 
they scanned the empty horizon and watched. The veterans turned around and slid down the slope to join Weber and help him dig a hole under the global. Renard joined in next to Brooks and Jones. Desmond bounced down the slope and stood over the foxhole as they finished up. The light was fading fast, and he spoke over the radio. Everybody in the hole. What about sentries? Weber glanced at Bellhop and Tay as the men dropped down into the foxhole one by one. Everyone. We're too close to separate now. Desmond moved everyone into the hole and took one last look around before stepping over the side. He landed and sat down in one motion. Weber keyed the force field and sent a shimmering glow across the top of their hiding place. Within seconds, sand and dust drifted across the top obscuring it in the deepening shadows of the night. 12. Chapter 12 We're going to be the first human colony on Mars, Columbus joked. I'm not polyamorous, and snapped. What's that? I can't love more than one man. Who said anything about love, sister-wife? There aren't any other sisters here, so it's brother-husband. Stow it, said Dawson as he scanned the edge of the horizon and compared it to the tablet in his hand. Our colony would last until we turned Donner Party and ate Columbus. Why do you think I'd be the first to get eaten? Your legs, said Dawson. Lot of meat on those. I'm gamey. Besides, what would you cook me with? I've got a signal, the captain pointed toward the horizon. One hundred clicks. That's two days, and breathe. We don't have enough air to make it. Dawson checked the readout on his suit. She was right. They had a 24-hour supply built in. Maybe they could stretch it to 28 by reducing oxygen flow. That would make the CO2 build up in their suits and impact their ability to move effectively. He was going to have to do some calculations to determine how much to restrict the flow, but that's something they could accomplish on the move. The longer they sat at the landing site, the harder it would get further on. We can make it in one, he said. We're going to have to hustle, keep moving forward, but we can make it. You don't sound so sure, Captain, Columbus said. We're out of options, so our choice is to stay here and die or get moving and die. If we move, we have a chance. If we don't, we don't. Aye, aye. Anne shifted off the rock and began moving in the direction the captain pointed. Dawson and Columbus fell in step behind her. Three sailors, alone in hostile territory, headed for a dead ship, Columbus muttered. It could be worse, Anne called back. How? Columbus muttered, but she didn't answer. She didn't have to. 13. Chapter 13. Davis settled in the sand and leaned his back against the wall. The men around him released their helmets and set them in their laps, so he did the same. He stared at Weber across from him. I know you. Weber dug a couple of ration packs out of his leg pocket and leaned forward to pass one to Davis and Renard before he tore into one himself. We serve together. I don't think so. I can't place you. How long have you been in? I came in after the Citadel. The men grunted and shook their heads in memory of the battle for Citadel, one of the first Martian conflicts. The bloody, brutal fight had set the tone for the war and left hundreds of thousands of Marines littering the landscape. What did you do? Murder one. Grand Theft Auto, Jones confessed. Hey, Renard, what the hell did you do to end up here? Bellhop called across the hole. The baby-faced boy shrugged. Street kid. They're picking kids up off the street to fight. Weber sighed. Just the slow ones. Not too many slower than you, Bellhop smiled. What about you? Davis asked Weber. His eyes glazed over as he dipped into a memory. A young girl walked past a group of four street thugs sitting on a car, Weber one of them. His young face belied a world-weary attitude. Want to have some fun? The largest of the group shoved him off the car. They fell in behind the girl and moved up on her like wolves surrounding prey. The big one grabbed her by the arm 
and jerked her in the alley. She began to scream, but his meaty paw covered her mouth and choked it off. You first, he glared at Weber. The other boys held her thrashing limbs down, her smooth soft skin scraped against the rough concrete and grit leaving red scratches and trails of blood. Tears glistened in the streetlight as they ripped off her clothes. She whimpered. Weber unbuttoned his pants and climbed on top of her. Her muffled scream echoed in his ear as he pushed inside her. She glared at him, studying him as he thrust and grunted. The boys around him grunted and cheered encouragement. Weber finished and collapsed on top of her. The large thug grabbed him by the pants and jerked him off the girl. My turn, he grunted and put his knees between hers. They were flooded in a spotlight as a loud voice echoed through the alleyway. Freeze. Policemen in riot gear moved in on them, swinging clubs and deploying tasers. Weber fell to the asphalt, his head bouncing off the black tarmac, and the last thing he saw before darkness claimed him was the staring eyes of the girl. He woke in the cargo hold of a ship, the ice-cold metal almost frozen to his skin. He sat up among twenty-five other convicts, crammed knee to knee on a row of benches in the narrow bay. They were all cuffed to a pipe, their hands locked to one side of them as an armed guard moved down the strip. Weber tried to move his feet, but they were bound to the floor too. The men around him prayed while others cried and begged and still more sat in silence. A red light strobed above the guard, and he picked up a radio microphone. You are being dropped into an artificial atmosphere. Do not shoot the power field or you will die. Weapons will be dropped after you. Choose one and move to the building at the top of the hill. Your objective is to take that building. His face was hidden by a black reflective visor that cast a distorted mirror image of the convicts back at them. They looked almost more like animals than men. Loose clothing flapped on thin limbs, gaunt cheeks and dry mouths. Weber felt like he'd been sleeping for a week, and he had a headache. Did they gas him? Pray to your maker. The guard slipped the microphone back into a holder and grabbed a loop in the ceiling. He stepped onto a small metal plate welded to the wall as the floor opened beneath the convicts and spilled them into the red dust surface of Mars. The pipe they were chained to popped free from the wall, and the men slid out in groaning thuds onto the hard surface of the planet. They were at the bottom of a boulder-strewn hill, staring up at a five-story structure built at the top. Licks leaned out of openings in the side of the building and blasted at the cargo ship as it roared through a force field and away from the convicts. Weber spied a giant generator resting not too far from their position. The power pack for the artificial atmosphere that extended over them like a dome. A case slammed into the ground next to them. One of the convicts jumped up to open in and took a bolt to the chest. A second man fumbled the lid off and scooped up a rifle. He spun around to return fire, and another man slammed both fists on the back of his neck and took the weapon. A lick blast cut him in half, and the rifle clattered to the ground. They were being picked off one by one from the licks in the building, and Weber noticed more pouring out of the doorways. He grabbed a blaster, knelt on one knee and tried to sight down the rifle. He pulled the trigger. Nothing happened. He glared at the non-working weapon as he watched a third convict pitch over beside him. Someone grabbed his rifle and flipped it over. They turned on the power button and shoved it back to him. Weber lined up a shot on the doorway and sent a blast into the next alien that popped out then the next. Move! Someone screamed and he ran for cover behind a boulder. He leaned out and sent three bolts into three bodies. Two convicts joined him as they began to return fire in a disciplined manner back toward the buildings. The licks fell as they were picked off, but the convicts were outnumbered and dying fast. Weber knew they were sitting ducks. He began crawling from boulder to boulder toward the building, stopping every few feet to shoot an alien. They fired back but missed him, searing the ground around him. Acrid smoke and the scent of burnt flesh filled the shallow atmosphere and made his vision hazy. He fired shot after shot into the aliens, into their fortress, until his power pack ran dry. The other two men followed him up. One skidded a rifle toward Weber 
and exploded as a blast smashed into him, covering him in a red fine mist that matched the color of the sand. Weber checked the power pack, rolled over, and shot the weapon's cache below them. It sent a fireball that rolled up until it hit atmosphere, then spread out in flames that slid back down the inside of the force field dome. The licks cowered. He jumped up and ran for the building, firing into the confused aliens and killing them. The other convict jumped with him, falling in step as they hit the doorway and fought their way to the top. Licks fell in the stairwell. They fell out of open windows as Weber and the convict moved up. The convict shoved him aside to be the first to the top of the roof. A lick blasted his body back into Weber, knocked his rifle loose. It clattered down the steps. Weber struggled under the dead weight of the body. The lick leaned out of the doorway, its tongue slithered over its long snout. It lined up a shot. Weber jerked the dead man's blaster up and shot the alien. It fell forward into the stairwell and knocked an advancing line of licks down in hisses and growls. Weber rolled over and picked them off. He scrambled up and crawled through the doorway to the roof. It was empty. He moved toward the edge and peeked over, ready to shoot the last of the aliens. Nothing moved. Flames flickered where the weapons box once stood. Smoke curled off dead bodies of convicts and licks scattered down the hillside. He rolled up to his knees and looked harder. He was the last man standing. Two shuttles eased over the horizon and slid through the force field into the artificial atmosphere. Marines poured out of the open ramp doors and established a perimeter as a second group began offloading supplies. Weber trudged down the slick stairwell, stepping over bodies and around pieces of men. He stepped out of the building and walked down the hill, weapon held to his side. The Marines stopped working and trained their blasters on the soot-covered, grimy stained man as he approached. Commander Cree stepped out of the back of a shuttle and marched up to him, burly on his heels. Were you in the first wave? Yeah, Weber grunted. You will address him as sir. How many others? Weber looked around at the dead bodies, down at his blood-splattered clothes, and wiped some of the gore off his face. Just me. Get him cleaned up and in a suit, Cree commanded. I want you suited up and in my command tent in ten minutes. He doesn't have any training, Burley started to say. How many battles have you fought on Mars? Cree cut him off. Yes, sir. Burley hustled Weber toward the ramp of the command shuttle as it rested in the shadow of the building they designated the Citadel. To be continued.